Okay. Hey, how y'all doing? Hopefully this is working here. Uh, Dennis Sampson coming at you. I got a, a, a thought that I want to share with you today. Uh, and specifically uh, coming about because I passed by this church here that is now up for rent. Let me see if I can get this turn around here. And as we're looking here, I blocked out part of the number there so there's no problems. It says fully furnished church for rent. Church for rent here. Now, the, the thing about it is this, and I'm going to move off the street here because, uh, A, I can't see you know, how this thing looks there on the screen, and B, I've got all the uh, cars driving past and whatnot. But here we are. Uh, we've got this church here that is up for rent. We've, we've got a problem all across our, our land here where we've got these uh, buildings that are closing. These churches that are going under, and it really shouldn't be that way. Not here in America, but it is. And churches all across are dying. Uh, they are dead. They're on life support here. And it's a horrible thing. And it got me to thinking about that, you know, over there in the book of Acts, chapter number 17, uh, Paul went into Thessalonica there, and he preached for three Sabbath days, and things were going good, got run out of town. But there was another group that the Apostle Paul came across. Yeah, uh, that other group there. Uh, the next group up, as it were, were the Bereans. And so I like to think of this as being the Berean call. We've all heard of the Macedonian call, uh, where Paul was called in that uh, vision there at night to go out to the uh, uh, Europe and begin to witness there in Europe. Okay. And he started. It didn't go all that great the first time, but you know what? There's a second group that came along. Uh, Bible talks about there in Acts chapter 17, uh, verses uh, 10 and 11, I believe it is. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. Uh, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and search the scriptures daily whether those things were so okay this is next group here comes along and Paul finds himself able to work with them okay Th this is what is needed someone who can take and fill in all right and I do apologize for closing the door there uh, but at the same time here it is Paul says you know what that group over there they may not get it that group over there may not be uh, ready to handle it, but I found someone else who can get the job done. So now who are these Bereans? Well, they're the next stop that came along. They're the next group, uh, the ones that will take over. And I've seen churches that have gone the Berean route, if you will. Uh, things just weren't all that good. And that particular church had to do something desperate. They had to reorganize the work. Uh, they had to shut down altogether. Uh, whatever the case is there, you know, bring in fresh blood. And the next group comes along and the church begins to flourish again. Uh, people start getting help from God again, the way that it needs to be. But too often, far too often, as we just saw with that church there, things have gone south. Like I said, we've got churches all across this land that are dying, churches that are dead, churches that are on life support. Let, let me break those three down there for you real quickly. Uh, those that are dead, they tend to not know it. Okay, just, just being honest with you, they tend to not know it. Why is that? Simple. Because they refuse to follow God's will with the pastor's vision. You know, uh, I remember uh, when the Lord was calling me to pastor uh, my first church there. And once I saw that, okay, yeah, the Lord is calling me to do this. Now, Lord, what is the next step? Uh, began to pray about uh, the revival meetings. You know, what, what are we going to do there? Uh, I felt burdened to preach a sermon series, uh, change Sunday school material. And, and yeah, there, there was some people who, uh, you know, and not not really comfortable doing this, but we worked together. People started to get on board, and there started to be a little bit of change. Now, a lot of churches nowadays they're dead, and they refuse to change. Absolutely, oh, the, this pastor has a vision. Well, that's fine so long as it lines up with what we're already doing. 
God has a will. Well, Lord, thy will be done so long as it is our will. Hmm. And some of these churches are dead simply because they've been without a pastor for months. Uh, and the months have begun to blur into years. And they've gotten quite comfortable with it. They, they, they don't need... I, I, let me say it again. They don't need to rush out and get a pastor. They can take their slow, sweet time. Because things are working out. Really? Check your pulse. You ain't got one. God said that he would give them pastors. They ain't got a pastor. They're, you know, they got a bunch of guys coming in and preaching. Hey, that's great. But they haven't seriously considered any of these preachers to be a pastor for the longest. Not great. Church is dead. Another thing why these churches are dead, there is no witnessing. There's no going and knocking on doors. And I realize we're still in all this COVID mess and people are, are gun shy about getting too close to other people and going visiting and whatnot. You know what? Those are just limp excuses for what we were already doing as a nation. Now, it, I'm not a fan of Jehovah Witnesses. I think they're, that their doctrine is wrong. But you know what? One thing that they do do, they knock on doors. Okay, they, they go and they try to get their message out. Uh, us Christians, we haven't tried to get our message out in a long time. And even when you do get people together who are willing to go from the local assembly out into the neighborhood, start knocking on doors, you've got one, two, three, four, if you're really lucky. Ain't helping none. Sunday school, poorly attended. A lot of people, they'll show up just in time for church or a little after church starts. Uh, they're skipping Sunday school. Well, I don't need Sunday school. I graduated school years ago. Uh, when do we ever stop growing in the Lord? When do we ever finally know all there is to know about God? Remember uh, uh, J. Vernon McGee years ago heard in one of his broadcasts, and he went home to be with the Lord back in the 80s. But he had said in this broadcast uh, that, you know, he was looking forward to heaven and, and learning more there and was hoping he could even get to teach a Sunday school class there in heaven to, to continue to expound. We've not arrived. But people, they skip Sunday school. They don't need it no more. Uh, it, it, too much time in the morning trying to get the kids ready. It's because we're not preparing the day before to get ready to go to church. And this whole idea about being present for every single church service? Ha, 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 ha. I don't think so. That's the attitude anyways. I mean, I understand you got to work, you got to work. But when you ain't got to work, how about being in church? You got a revival meeting coming up. How about going and supporting that, that meeting there? Uh, a lot of churches nowadays, you got you barely have a skeleton crew of uh, the members showing up for meetings, and you're already paper thin as is. People aren't just aren't they're not showing up, and that's the church is dead that way. Churches also are dead because they rely more on their tradition. This is how we've done it. It has always worked in the past. Well, there's a reason why it's in the past and why it's not continuing to work now because its time has come and gone. Leave it buried. Get some new material. Now, I'm not saying change that King James Bible. Oh, no, sir, Billy Bob Bodine. No, that continues to work. It's man's traditions that don't work, that stop working, that give up, that fall apart. I mean, you look at the Pharisees there for a moment. You know, that whole movement started as a means to teach God's people and to make sure that they didn't go back into polytheism, to stick with just the Lord God. But because man was part of it, it corrupted. Same thing today. You know, we may not call them Pharisees, but guess what? We still got them nowadays. And the whole, the trend is my friend thing there. Our church ebbs and flows. We see cycles of growth. We see cycles of contraction. It'll always continue to work. No, you're going down the drain. You're just refusing to accept it. Well, we've got our bank accounts. We've got property we could sell. We can weather the storm. It's not a storm when you're buried. Okay? Let's face 
facts here. You need to do something drastic. You need to reorganize the work. You need to bring in fresh blood. How do we bring in fresh blood? Well, you don't go raiding other churches. You go out there and you start winning souls for Christ. You start building up the youth, especially the youth. Oh, my soul, the youth. I heard a pastor the other day comment how they'd prayed for years to get some men in the church. Now he's looking down from the pulpit and he sees, well, I should have been more specific in my prayers for men because there's really young and we've got to grow them <laughs> physically the, the, the kids are you know five six seven eight <laughs> it's gonna take years before they're the next generation of men but you know what at least they got them amen a lot of these dead churches out there the youngest persons in their 40s that's no good and as far as that the bank accounts and the land go guess what Eventually, the money will dry up and the land will all be sold off. It's a dead church waiting on a Berean call to be made. Uh, what about the dying churches? Well, these are the ones who, they're, they're not seeing any growth at all. They're just waiting until no one is left, hoping, hoping for a miracle that, that somebody will happen to walk through the doors of the church and, and want to join the church. That ain't how it goes, people. That's why you're dying. You still got an opportunity to go out there. You still got an opportunity. You got to stop being comfortable with where you're at. Let God stir the nest and get out there and start doing something about it. Before you become dead. I've seen too many churches go that way. And you've got the churches there on life support. And what's the difference between life support and dying, church preacher? Well, I'm glad you asked. Uh, the ones on life support are those that have a few who do more than just care. They are actually trying. They often, far too often, they're overshadowed by those who are stuck in their tradition uh, who think they're the ones who are large and in charge, and you better do things my way. But they've got a few people who will actually work, who actually want to see the church grow, who actually are trying to make the Berean call. But there's too many people that'll sit there and say, you know what, I want to sit here on the sideline and let you do all the work. And I've been doing all the work for years. I'm tired and all. And people get burned out. I admit it. Totally admit it. People get burned out. But we'll burn out each other in the process. And eventually those people who do actually care about the church and who actually want to see that church live, they throw in the towel. They'll turn around and they'll go, find another church. They'll become dead like uh, the rest of the bunch. They'll just drop out altogether. It, it's a sad thing. I've seen too many churches. They're, they're on that life support and too many people in the church just don't care. Now I realize, I realize we live in the Laodicean church age. And, and that's a bad thing, and Jesus is going to be coming back soon. Okay, I, I get all of that. But one thing we tend to overlook real easily when we read about the church of Laodicea is that Jesus counseled them to buy gold of him that had been tried in the fire. Jesus just told the Laodicean church, it ain't too late. There's still a call to be made, a call to be answered for the church to get revived. If it was already too late, do you think that Jesus would have gave them some sort of an option that would help them? Hey, buy gold of me. Hey, get you some white garments, not spotted. If it was too late, Jesus would have just hung up the phone on those turkeys. He'd have told John right to the church of Laodicea. Too late. Too late now. No hope for you. No. Say, so, well, preacher, how do you know that, that it wasn't too late for the church of Laodicea? I'm glad you asked that. How about this prime example? When Jesus stood before Herod, 
and Herod wanted him to perform like a trained monkey. Do some miracles for me, Jesus. Jesus, preach for me like John used to preach. Come on, Jesus, dance for me. Jesus kept his mouth shut the entire time he was there in front of Herod. Now contrast that when he was in front of Pontius Pilate. He actually talked with Pilate. Oh, it may not have been long conversations, but there was still a chance for Pilate. He was willing to talk with him. Herod? Nope, Herod was too far gone. These churches that are dead, like that one that we just uh, looked at that is fully furnished, dead. Too late for them. But there's still a Berean call. Someone somewhere can come along and say, hey, I want to give that church building a chance. I want to come in there and I want to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want to bring some hell, fire, and brimstone preaching there to northwest Indiana. And a fully furnished building will help me. Now, if you're such a person, uh, you get in touch with me and I will get that phone number off there for you if it ain't too late by then. And I'll message it to you, no problem. I got nothing to do with this church. I just happened to drive by it. But it broke my heart when I drove by it and saw that this church is now desperately in need of a Berean call. There's a bar across the street, a mechanic shop behind it. There's a neighborhood on the other side of the alley that needs to be reached. Yeah, I know some of our communities have a whole lot of churches and a whole lot of denominations. Since when does that matter? We were called to preach the gospel. And maybe with having this building here, fully furnished, maybe this can be a help to somebody. But you know what? We're never going to know if we don't make the effort if we don't start calling I don't know but there's a Berean call to be made Macedonian calls to get out there and, and to see soul saved the Berean call is to be the next group up can we be the Berean call can we say hey Jesus can I have a chance at that not because it's us. No, 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 no. But because of what we surrender to let Jesus do in our lives, through our lives. I hope this has been a help for you. And it's just a thought that I wanted to share with you today. I thank you for your attention.